Good morning. I'm Bonnie Gardner. I'm co-chair of the Public Affairs Forum of the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Austin. We're located at 4700 Grover Avenue, and we want to welcome you to our forums. They occur most Sundays at noon. For more information about our Public Affairs Forum, please go to our church website at www.austinuu.org. And now, Richard Halpin is going to introduce today's speaker. Richard, thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. We are pleased and privileged today at the First Unitarian Universalist Church Forum to have as our speaker the Executive Director of the Texas Trout Project, Alyssa Bergen. When I asked Alyssa what it is she wanted me to say about her, she said, just get my name right. <clears throat> But the more important thing here is the Zen of this. This is a person who, like the best citizen in each of us, the best patriot in each of us, the best American, the best Texan in each of us, Alyssa has been speaking out about the issues that affect our land, our air, our water, our Texas, in the most profound ways. It's people like Alyssa I think that speak to the cells in each of us, to speak to the heart and the soul in each of us, to say, this is our chance, this is our opportunity to save the sacred land we live in. So I'd like you to join with me in putting your hands together for a wonderful, warm reception for Alyssa Bergen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Becky and Dale and Pat as well, and certainly thanks to every member of the Green Sanctuary Committee. Um, I feel like we've all been together in this journey. Um, I first got interested in what was going on in the shale about five years ago when I got into a conversation with an oil and gas attorney, Jeff Weems, who was then considering a run for office. And Jeff told me that he had many bad memories of working in the oil fields himself, and those bad memories were sort of cemented every year when he had to visit his doctor because he'd had many signs of cancer, and he was only in his 30s. That's the legacy of oil and gas in Texas, and that's why I've entitled this project Living and Dying in the Eagleford Shale. I'm really just going to start out doing some very basics about the Eagleford Shale, in this particular picture, you'll see the yellow in the lower section, which indicates the Eagleford Shale, and the yellow in the upper section, which indicates the Barnett Shale. But there are other shales as well. You start to combine shales. There's something called the Woodbine Shale. And the area where now they're going to be doing fracking in Bastrop and Lee County is actually a combination of the Woodbine and the Eagleford, and it's referred to as the Eaglebine. This shows several of the different shales and what they call the San Marcos Arch, which changes the geology of the area. Um, the Eagle Bind Prospect, there's the upper and the lower Eagle Bind, because they get highly technical with all this. But it determines what they get out of the particular shales. Uh, in some places they get oil, in some places they get very wet gas, in others they get very dry gas. This is just your basic graph showing air emissions from the particular structures in oil and gas development in the Eagleford Shale. And uh, it's quite complex. They'll tell you that they're just going to come in and put a rig on a particular pad, and, and at the end, they'll return it to exactly what it used to look like. But considering that they use all these biocides to kill the grass and pretty much everything that lives anywhere nearby, and they clear it all off, and they bring all this heavy equipment on it, and they continue to replace equipment with more equipment, there's really no way that it can be considered something that's repairable or something that we can fix later. Some of these wonderful photos are courtesy of Al Braden, Al Braden Photography. Uh, this is just a picture of a Catula Eagle for Shale frack pond. Oh, uh, that looks so harmless, right? Like a really large swimming pool, except that it's got chemical-laden water in it, chemicals perhaps in as high a concentration as several parts uh, per million, and worse than that, it's got some of the worst chemicals and the most deadly chemicals known to man. We'll get into that a little bit later. Um, here's one of those well pads that's going to go back to looking perfectly normal later. You'll notice a tremendous amount of deforestation, and no, not all of that is caused by the fact that you're in South Texas. Um, some of that has been raked off, and the rest of it has been biocided. Um, 
And these, of course, continue to demonstrate the industry lie that the earth is barely disturbed. It's like a moonscape down there in so many places. This is a rail yard where they bring pipe in, where they bring sand in. It's a 24-hour opera 24 operation with a great deal of noise, a great deal of dust. This has completely transformed the formerly sleepy little town of Catula. And these, of course, are flaring pump jacks in Catula. You'll see a lot of flares in this presentation because flares are a big part of the problem, a big part that could be solved, but the industry doesn't seem to care to solve it. A recent study showed that 36% of the gas in the North Dakota shale had been flared on one particular occasion. That's 36% of gas that presumably could be used to heat homes or any of the other myriad uses that they say natural gas is so wonderful for. So why are they just venting it up into the sky or burning it with a flare? This is just a, an amusing little scan of where some of the complaints have come from in the Eagleford Shale. The reason I say it's kind of amusing is because the industry would tell you that no one ever complains. No one ever says anything about contaminated water. There's never been one single case proven of contaminated water. Well, that's not exactly true. First of all, they have a, a big denial system going where they deny, 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 and then when someone finally proves their case, they buy them out and they make them sign a non-disclosure agreement and they can never talk about the issue again. Perhaps they've gotten just barely enough money to cover their current expenses. Perhaps they've gotten just barely enough money to cover expenses that they know will come, but they really don't know the scope of them if family members are ill. Here's some photos courtesy of Sharon Wilson, who many of you probably know from the Earthworks organization. She publishes a blog, Blue Days Drilling Reform, and that's a D-A-Z-E. And she has some of the most concurrent information about fracking in the state of Texas. Um, these are just two of the flares in the Eagleford Shale. These two particular flares are in the Carn City area. You can drive through that area at night and it looks like daylight because there's so much flaring going on that has turned the night sky into day. Here's a flare by moonlight. This is right outside the Cynthia Dupnick home in Carnes County. Now, Cynthia is a friend of mine, a new friend of mine. Cynthia and her family have experienced many, many health issues from bleeding from the nostrils to upper respiratory illness to now increasingly linked to this particular exposure, some form of irritated bowel disease. And many of her children have these illnesses. She has these illnesses. She's wondering what her family can do because they have literally lived on the land for generations. Worst case scenario, fracking in your backyard. These pictures come from Denton. Denton arrived a little late to the concept that perhaps we might need a drilling ordinance. I'm afraid too many cities in Texas have no drilling ordinances. They have no way to restrict where drilling might take place. And as a result, these rigs have gone up almost right next door to people's houses. Worst case scenario, lightning strikes one of those rigs and happens to be in your backyard. Think about how that would play out. This was in Harrison County. Fortunately, it was out in virtually the middle of nowhere. But I hate to think that someone wasn't affected in some way. So let's get down to some brass tacks about fracking. You know how they used to say, it's the economy, stupid. Well, that's what people will tell you about fracking, that it's, it's the economy. It's how the economy has completely changed all of these cities throughout Texas. And down in South Texas, where the Eagleford Shale is, I have to admit, many of those cities were in very bad shape. In the first place, a bunch of them have been through boom and bust cycles before. Let's take Carnes County. Carnes County has had oil and gas in the 30s, oil and gas again when the Austin chalk was discovered, and they even had a uranium boom until the EPA stepped in and said, wow, you're getting uranium into the water. That might be a problem. So they've had boom and bust cycles before, and I don't mind telling you that just 10 years ago, parts of Carnes County looked like ghost towns. There was one area I was particularly fond of in Falls City where it looked like an Old West group of buildings. You really looked like you were in the middle of some sort of movie about the Old West because all of these buildings were boarded up and they were decaying and it was pretty sad. Well, that's all changed. But along with it have changed a bunch of other things and we're going to discuss those. We're going to discuss them one by one. You can take a look at this list, but we'll go through them. So we'll also talk about how it's really the environment stupid and we're really fracking our environment in South Texas and elsewhere. 
and we need to find a way to do something about that. Infrastructure insufficiency, that's the first mention on my list. Again, the, the booms and busts of the past have left many cities in South Texas virtual ghost towns. And obviously, when kids graduated from high school, there were no jobs. And so they left, and they went off to other cities, and they left areas that perhaps had been in their families since the 1840s or the 1850s. Some of the people who settled these areas are descendants of Polish, German, Czech, even Prussian families, and they're very close-knit, and it really disturbed them when children had no other choice but to go off to the big city. But that began to change. And of course, if you look at these little towns as well, they have a, a tremendous amount of infrastructure insufficiency because they never really had the infrastructure in the first place. Most of these towns got their electricity through rural electrification. And in the overall scheme of things, that came pretty late. It wasn't until Lyndon Johnson was in Congress that that became part of the everyday life of South Texans, that they were able to turn on a light bulb. Uh, even water and sewer were minimal in most of these cities because they never really needed it. And obviously, there weren't that many restaurants, there weren't that many stores. There really wasn't that much infrastructure at all. But then all of a sudden, thousands of people have descended upon the area and they have slapped up buildings, and they have put together water and sewer that probably should not have been put together in that fashion, and they have really conducted an all-out system of making a town work. That works in some places, it doesn't work in others. And you'll, you'll see more and more of that as you drive through these areas, and I certainly hope that many of you will. Crime in the shale has been another problem, partially because there weren't that many large police departments or sheriff's departments to begin with. They never really had that much crime, so why should they have that large a police force? But if the Eagleford Shale follows the pattern of other shales, then they're going to see some very large increases in crime. Documented here, uh, disorderly conduct arrests in the Marcella Shale increased by 17%, um, and the prevalence of sexually transmitted diseases increased by 60%, and prostitution by 49%. Well, one of my more amusing turns in life earlier was that when I was in college, I worked for the Travis County Sheriff's Department. Um, that's given me a certain lingua franca with the police and the sheriff's department throughout the shale. So I admittedly cozy up to them. I see them at a convenience store, at a restaurant, and, and I stop them and I tell them a little bit about my background and perhaps I get a little bit more of a Texas accent. And I start saying, hmm, well, what's going on in your backyard? And they tell me things. They tell me about arrests for altercations. They tell me about the bars opening and the bars that won't close when they're supposed to under Texas Alcoholic Beverage Commission laws. And they tell me about all the problems that have come about and how they can't possibly get enough money to hire enough officers to fight them and how that has changed the quality of life for everybody there. And of course, I'm sure you've heard about, because it's been in headlines, road destruction, what these big rigs, especially in repeated visits, have done to roads across the Eagleford Shale. You know, at one point, the Department of Transportation came up with this kind of insane idea that they were going to convert some of the more heavily damaged roads to gravel, which the prospect of seeing these truckers maneuver their rigs down gravel really left me with a very uneasy edge, because I'm frequently down there as well for meetings. And I might add, as I say, personal witness, um, I've sustained about $3,000 worth of damage to my vehicle from trying to travel on those roads, including replacing a wheel, replacing part of the suspension system, and, and having things break in terms of engine mounts that should never break in a car. But that's the consequence of suddenly being forced to drop off the pavement about eight inches because it no longer exists. The people who lived in these towns were used to traveling these back roads in a very leisurely fashion. Children learned to drive and drove at age 12 or 13 because it was safe. Well, it's not safe anymore. In my time traveling in the shale, I've personally witnessed three fatal accidents that involved tanker trucks. You have to think by extrapolation, if I personally have witnessed those three, then how many more have there been? And how many more of them are they just not talking about? We understand that several of the drilling companies very quickly sign non-disclosure agreements on those as well. But in Pennsylvania, the cost of accidents was finally put at $28 million for the amount of time that the Marcella Shale has been in operation. I don't really think we can stand that much more cost 
on top of the cost that oil and gas is already not paying. A typical day in Kennedy, Texas photo, courtesy of my friend Sharon Wilson again. Suddenly you're stopped at lights that you never had to stop at before. Sometimes it takes you three or four lights to get through an intersection. Sometimes there's a disastrous accident right in the middle of town. Just the other day, there was an oil spill that closed a highway near Carnes County for two days. They were unsure of exactly how much oil was spilled, and of course, as always, they didn't catch the trucker. They never catch the trucker. They have some very lax laws in places like Laredo, unfortunately, and frack fluids are spilled in Laredo about once a week on the average, and the city has to absorb the cost of cleaning up. These are hazardous materials cleanups, and needless to say, they're not inexpensive. And also, needless to say, some of those hazardous materials are getting into the water. Then we have the dark side of the economic boon. And that's kind of complicated because people don't always grasp, for one thing, not everyone in one of these little towns can work in the shale. I mean, there are older folks that can't go out with an oil field job. There are younger folks that really aren't to be trusted with that kind of equipment. Perhaps they're not trained. And then, of course, there are all sorts of jobs there in the shale that don't get paid the same amounts of money that people in the oil field sector get paid. So as a consequence, you have people making minimum wage, service jobs, restaurant, retail, and they're suddenly being forced into a cost of living structure that doesn't meet what they are getting in payment. So as a consequence, thank you, as a consequence, um, what they're finding is that traditionally they get squeezed out. Rents have gone up. In some cases, rents have quadrupled and quintupled. In many cases, they are putting five to ten people in an apartment that was intended for one or two. And they're charging each one of those people about $500 a week. So obviously there are not ordinary people that can afford that anymore. So everything else goes up as well. I always try to time myself that I don't have to buy gas in the shale because ironically, gasoline is very expensive in the shale, which is kind of the opposite of what you might expect. Uh, everything else is more expensive in the shale. Stop and get one of my Diet Pepsis and, oh wow, over $2 in some places in the shale. Everything is more expensive in the shale. And then we have the very, very dark side of industry accidents. And before I talk about some of the deaths, I'm going to tell you about the man with the melting shoes. I was in a convenience store in Kennedy one day, and this fellow kind of hung around my car. And for a moment, I was a little bit worried because I've got Earthworks bumper stickers on my car. And then he came up to me and he said, what do you do? And I thought, OK, it's over now. They'll find my body on a back road somewhere. Uh, but he said, no, I'm really interested. What do you do? And I pretty much had connected him with the Halliburton red and white truck parked over to the side. And I said, well, I, I work for people like you in the shale. And he said, OK, so maybe you can help me figure out something. Fine, what's that? So the weirdest thing happened to me the other day. I'd been out on an oil rig taking samples and doing measurements. And I went back to the house, because I live around here. And as I was walking in, my wife stopped me and she said, what are you tracking into the house on our good floors? And he looked down and he said, well, I'm not tracking anything. And he realized his boots were melting. The soles of his boots were melting. The plastic, the rubber, was coming off with each step he took. And that moment crystallized for him. If what I am exposed to is melting the soles of my shoes, then what am I bringing back to my family? And what am I breathing in in my lungs? And he wanted that answer from me. And of course, other than a very rudimentary chemistry lesson, I, I couldn't really tell him. But I can tell you right now that we stood there for a full 30 minutes and talked about the consequences of working in the shale. And I keep hoping I'll see him again, but to be honest with you, I keep hoping I'll see him again and he won't be driving a red and white Halliburton truck. There's so many people like him in the shale. There's so many people who will die from their exposure in the shale because deaths from oil and gas are 7.6 times the rate of all other industry workers. Some new stats just came out the other day, and that is that in the last six years, 663 deaths have taken place in hydraulic fracturing, and 60% of that is in Texas. Now, 60% of the rigs are not in Texas. 
60% of the production is not in Texas, but 60% of the deaths are in Texas. And twice as many workers died in the year 2012 as in 2011. We don't have the numbers on 2013 yet, but I think that should send a very serious message to everybody that this is going the wrong direction. We're not getting safer. And 13 people have died in the Eagleford Shale thus far, even though production is very new there. Here's a typical chart from the Department of Labor, fatal occupational injuries in the private sector mining, quarrying, oil, and gas extraction in industry. And um, you'll definitely see there that uh, all other mining is the light part. Oil and gas extraction is the dark part. And it just gets darker and darker. And then, of course, we have those issues that I kind of touched on earlier, the culture clash. You know, there's plenty of retirees in this part of the world. There are people who think they, they've gone to live the American dream. In some cases, they went back to the land that their family used to own surrounded with people with their same last name. So help me, sometimes I think that in Poth, everyone is named Pavlik, but I suppose that's not really possible. But nonetheless, they have a culture there. They love that culture. They go to the same churches that they went to when they were children, and they're very close. And it's, a, it's an important thing for them to be among people like themselves. But things have changed. Again, teenagers who drive on city streets in the past, they, they don't do that anymore. It's too dangerous. And gas compressors, trucks, and diesel engines, they never stop. The noise never stops. It's always going on. And again, this is kind of the end of the American dream for these residents. And of course, we get into what exactly it is that might be making these people sick. And believe me, there are plenty of people who are sick. You may have seen some of the reports lately from the Weather Center and from the Center for Public Integrity. Uh, Mr. Jim Morris did most of the investigative research on that. And Sharon Wilson and I were proud to accompany him on some of his trips and to give him extensive interviews, to tell him people he should contact, people he should talk to, and to bring out a litany of the harmed. And believe me, they're harmed all over these counties in South Texas. And it stands in such complete contrast to our visits there three years ago when people were so hopeful about what benefits the economy could bring to them. But now they're getting sick. There's the famous BETX blend, benzene, ethyl benzene, toluene, and xylene. And all of these are endocrine disruptors. They all call, cause cancer. They, many of them cause leukemia. They have teratogenic effects. This is a very recent study by, done by the University of Colorado and one of the first studies on health effects in the shale. One of the comments that the University of Colorado made almost immediately when they began this study is that no one has really gone to the trouble to study the health effects in the shale. And what did they find? They found that if there's a density of 125 wells per mile, and believe it or not that's common, then the congestive heart defect rate congenital heart defect rate for newborn babies increases by 30%, and the neural tube rate defect doubles. And of course, pollution, particulate matter, and of course, diesel exhaust, which is all throughout the shale, those have been identified as part of the fifth leading cause of death in the United States. Chronic illness with acute onset, that's rampant all throughout the Eagleford Shale. In a town hall that Sharon Wilson put together in Pana Maria, which is a beautiful, formerly pristine area in the Carnes County uh, region, we saw the harmed line up to tell their story. I was sitting directly underneath one woman who complained of respiratory problems, and I had the very unfortunate view of part of her nose, which frankly was leaking blood throughout the entire evening. We sat and listened to story after story we sat and listened to hacking cough after hacking cough. We looked at mysterious rashes, one after the other after the other, from people who did not know each other, and yet they all had exactly the same symptoms. And all of these symptoms are commensurate with exposure to these particular chemicals. Then, of course, as exemplary, the marathon emissions incidents. In Carnes County on August 14th and September 5th, there was an incident, as they say, TCEQ, at the Sugarhorn facility of Marathon Gas. It was at a storage facility 
They had tank batteries. Uh, they really didn't know what happened, but they knew enough happened to evacuate all of their workers. You'd think then that they might have at least made an attempt to contact some of the people who lived nearby, but they didn't. And since then, we contacted, Sharon Wilson contacted Wilma Subra, who is a very well-known chemist operating out of Louisiana and has done a great deal of work in oil and gas. And she investigated, she took air samples, she's been back there many times, as has Sharon Wilson, and the results, frankly, were so stunning that one family is pursuing legal action, and probably many more will do as well. And these are the results of the Sugarhorn investigation, and I'm going to read these just for impact. 42.06 pounds of benzene, 8,535 pounds of propane, 4.2 pounds of ethyl benzene, 48 pounds of toluene, 32.79 pounds of xylene, 1.35 pounds of hydrogen sulfide, and over 10,000 pounds of miscellaneous volatile organic compounds. And what do these do? Well, benzene causes all of these. It's a carcinogen. It's a mutagen. It mutates cells. It causes leukemia. It causes the worst kind of leukemia, AML. It causes damage to blood cells. It irritates your skin, your eyes, your nose, your throat. It causes headaches, dizziness. It can make you very sick. Toluene, well, you know, if you buy that in the store to remove paint, it will have this big warning label on it, but apparently they can spew that through the air and it's not a problem. Well, it's a teratogen, so obviously if someone is carrying a baby in that area, that baby could be deformed or possibly even die in utero. It damages liver, kidney, and brain. It irritates skin, eyes, nose, and throat. It causes headaches and dizziness. And here's what additional chemicals do in the body. Ethylbenzene, pretty much the same thing. It's also a teratogen. Xylene, pretty much the same thing. But my favorite here is hydrogen sulfide because right at the end of the warning on hydrogen sulfide, it says, can cause death. And it's not death five years from now or five months from now. It's death instantaneously. It's death. Then, of course, we have seismic events. I'm sure you've heard about the earthquakes in the Barnett Shale. I'm sure you've heard about the earthquakes in the Eagleford Shale. They are strongly linked to the location of injection wells. What do you expect when you pour slick water down into the ground? They've been present in the twos and the threes. Loss of property value. Friends of mine, the Ruggieros, their property values were lowered from 350000 to 147000 because the tax assessor collector said, well, you only own the surface. You don't own what's below. So therefore, you don't really own anything. It's almost like you have a permanent lease. And I guess we have to ask ourselves, for so many of the people in the shale, how much is the value of your land if you just own the surface rights and nothing else? And then, of course, there's the elephant in the room, and that's environmental. There's so many places in this state now that are being blanketed by ozone pollution from the Eagleford Shale, and I come from one of them, San Antonio. When I was a child, San Antonio had bright blue skies every day, and I really thought it was paradise. Well, that paradise is being encroached by fugitive emissions, primarily methane and ozone, from the Eagleford Shale. And it is widely thought that it is only a matter of time now before the EPA reclassifies San Antonio as being not in attainment. That will cost every person in San Antonio a great deal of money. Sharon Wilson likes to show this picture because it tells an awful lot about water in the Barnett Shale, in every shale, because the oil and gas drilling company is right next door to the Groundwater Conservation District, and isn't that convenient? Here we have some perfect examples, fracking the Brazos River before fracking, after fracking. And here we have some of the most telling statistics of all, because you see, the basic issue is, when it comes to water, industry lies. Industry said they would probably use about, oh, 1 to 3 percent, maybe 5 percent in certain counties in the Barnett Shale of all the available water. And here's what they ended up with. There's a perfect example right there. State-sponsored mythology, what all of these particular counties were supposed to be using in terms of water. The worst one, Montague. In Montague County, they thought they were going to be using 1 to 7 percent. And you see, the problem is, in most counties, we don't have anything to record how much water is actually being used. 
So when you hear some study that says natural gas actually saves you water, well, that's not true because they're taking the numbers from the natural gas industry. Look at that chart again. Oil and gas in Montague County ended up using 91% of all the available water in the year 2010. 91%. Energy work blame, city going dry, and that of course is in Montague County. How much water do they use? Who knows? They lie about water use. They lie about everything to do with water use. There have been some extrapolations. There's a gentleman with Southwest Research Institute who's done st some statistics and some extrapolation for the Eagleford Shale. And he estimates that right now in the Eagleford Shale, even though they're not fully developed, they're already using 1,620,145,000 gallons of water a year. How much does San Antonio use in a year? 138 million gallons. So that doesn't compare very well. He warns that this takes place against a backdrop of aridity, and we have to remember most of these areas are in a, a protected groundwater management area where people are watching just how much water is being used. Can you recycle? Yes, but you can only recycle for water use again in the shale because 92% of the water stays in the hole, and you can only use the water at best two and a half times. And even if you did recycle, where would you put the water? Where would you put the recycling facility? And where would you put the toxic product at the end? Accepted waste fluids. Yes, they're putting it in a county dump. In another picture by Sharon Wilson, they're putting it in a leaking pipe, and it's coming into your groundwater. And then there's the issue that we must never forget, and that is all booms bust. Remember the Austin chalk? Remember how that was going to transform Giddings and many other areas? Well, it transformed it for a while, and then it busted. Just ask Carnes County about busting. Many people compare shale drilling to taking a washcloth, putting it in water, and then wringing it out. The first time you wring it out, you're going to get a lot of water. But subsequently, if you keep wringing, less and less comes out. Deborah Rogers is a very famous economist on shale matters, talks about on her website, shalebubble.com, that what they really want to do is they want, us, they want to get us hooked on natural gas while it's cheap. They want us to replace everything with natural gas, and then they want to export it through LNG to various places around the world so they can get that price up. And by then, we will have converted everything to natural gas and we'll be stuck with whatever price we have to pay. What will happen to the people in the shale? Medical bills? Whose responsibility? Whose problem? It's probably going to be all our problem once all the folks in the red and white Halliburton trucks and the Chesapeake trucks and the Incana trucks and the range resources and on and on and on are gone. And what is this problem for all of us? Well, let me put it this way. 15.3 million people in the United States live within one mile of a well. And as a microcosm of that, in Johnson County, which is in North Texas in the Barnett Shale, if you go back to the year 2000, there were only 20 wells. You'd find almost no one who lived anywhere near a well. Now, there are 3,900 wells, and 99.5% of all the people in Johnson County live within a mile of a well. So is it coming for you? Kind of. It's coming to Bastrop and Lee Counties. They've already drilled. They've already completed one well. They're going to be opening up old wells and using horizontal fracturing systems. So prepare now. If you have rural property, see one of us. See Sharon Wilson. Talk to someone about getting a model lease. Talk to someone about protecting yourself. But be aware. Shale is out there, and it's coming for you. Thank you very much. And now we'll take questions, raise your hands high, and we'll take them in the order you raise your hands. Richard? Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you for the catastrophic um, um, sharing of what's going on in our state. It's really awful. What, so now, uh, what are some options that people can do about it? How can people 
organize? How can people protect their health and their land and their water? What uh, kinds of lawsuits have been successful? What other um, things can people do to, 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 um, to corral and, and rope these, uh, these catastrophic events that are happening to well, Texans? There are, there are many things that people can do. I don't think they're going to be successful in the initial stages, but perhaps in the aggregate they will be. Um, right now, it probably comes as no surprise to people in Texas, that we have a legislature and we have leadership in our executive offices that are very friendly to oil and gas. So probably one of the most important things we could do is to replace those people. Um, and I, I'm not, you know, shilling for any party here. I'm just saying replace those people. Um, the folks in the Railroad Commission and the TCEQ, uh, I know that a lot of the lower staff work very hard at their jobs, but they're chronically understaffed, and everyone believes that's for a reason. Um, for example, I called on a spill um, following some severe rain in July, and TCEQ responded to the spill two weeks later. So until we can get some sort of actual responsible behavior out of our agencies, our regulatory agencies in this state, we're really lost. So I would say, you know, other than making changes throughout the political system, uh, we also need to call upon our elected officials, and we need to let them know how we feel about this, and we have to constantly tell them that we don't just see this as a bright economic shining star for the state of Texas. So. Okay, I've seen some questions here. Dale. Uh, I noticed you mentioned the... Um the massive flaring and its effect on air quality even in San Antonio. To me, San Antonio is 90 miles south of Austin. It would appear to me with southerly breezes that maybe Austin could become non-attainment as well. Um, are there predictions on that? Well, particularly with the increased amount of activity in what's called the Serban field, that's the actual geological name of the field they are fracking in Bastrop and Lee County. It's called the Serban field. Uh, with increased activity there, plus what's going on in San Antonio, it would only take a particular shift of the wind uh, to land all of that pollution in Austin. And here's kind of a bad sign. In my many trips where I have come directly from the shale up to Austin, uh, you get a, a sense of what the pollution looks like in terms of colors in the sky, and I've seen it in Austin in the same way that I've seen it in DeWitt and Gonzales County. So there's no question that it's coming this direction, yes. We have a question here. Would you stand and say your name? Thank you. Uh, Al Braden. Uh, just a quick comment. Thank you very much for, for all your research and work to bring this information to us. Uh, I've only been down there a little bit, but uh, it, it, it just struck me as, as we were just having a feeding frenzy on Mother Earth. It was just so enormous and so fast and what's amazing to me is how fast it's gone the railroad yard that you showed uh, I, I said what on earth do we need a railroad oh well that's to bring in the pipe it's to bring in the fracking sand to bring in the fracking chemicals by rail it, it's amazingly large and as I went home I thought well I've got to find all these locations on Google Earth so I know where I flew and all that and I looked at Google Earth and half of the picture of that rail yard was up to date and the other half was scrub. So Google, it's, it's happened in the last two years that that rail yard came yeah. in. So this whole thing is, is way out of control and speed. We don't realize how fast it's growing. And the question is, how do we get the political process to even deal with that? Thank you. Well, you know how they call this a slick water operation? because it's slick water. Well, it's also a slick operation politically. And there's been the same kind of lubrication along the line politically as there has been getting that gas out of the ground. Um, frankly, we, we need much better laws on uh, how some of our politicians are able to finance their campaigns and perhaps finance their offshore accounts. Um, we just need a, we need a much better system uh, that enables us to speak and does not just allow the rich corporations to run this state. We have a question here. Would you say your name, please? Stand up. Uh, Dick Kellerman, Sierra Club. 
Uh, Alyssa, I've been reading your emails for the last couple of months. Thank you very much. Uh, Bass Trap and Lee County have priceless stores of water in the Carrizo Wilcox. In Central Texas, Williamson County, uh, Travis County, Hayes County are practically out of water, maybe really out of water. And all three counties are planning to bring all of that Carrizo Wilcox water for us to drink in the future. It sounds like what you say happened in Barnett. We can't have both drinking water and fracking water. What do you think? Um, I, I don't think we can have both. Um, I've seen some stats on exactly how much water use there has been in the Barnett Shale total. And assuming, which is incorrect, that you are only using two and a half million gallons to frack a well, and believe me, it's not that small, then you'd be using 94 billion gallons of water uh, in the Barnett Shale. And of course, this is water that will never be returned to the hydrologic cycle again. But since two and a half gallons of water isn't enough to frack a well, you have to multiply that by about four. So we're talking about 360 billion gallons of water that has permanently been removed from the hydrological cycle. My biggest fear about water in Bastrop and Lee County being used for fracking is that Austin is being squeezed out of the water picture. Williamson County and Hayes County are already looking around and securing their own sources. Uh, Austin has too long relied on the Highland Lakes above ground reservoir storage, which evaporates, and they are most certainly going to get squeezed out of this play as more and more shale development occurs. And since they have completed one well, it's about a month ago, um, they've definitely poured themselves into others. Everything has been successful so far. They believe that it will go as planned. There will be a great deal more development in the servant field. So Austin better be going for plan C at this point because they're really stuck. A question from Jim Bryce. Would you stand? <clears throat> uh, yes, you, you hinted at this, but uh, uh, the reason this is all happening is called money. And money that's dealing with a resource that uh, is expensive to develop and can be concentrated in the hands of a very few. The church here has a solar area. Mm -hmm. We're seeing now, those of us who are keeping up the technology, dramatic drops in the cost of alternative energy mm -hmm. that uh, can be distributed rather than concentrated. Uh, what do you see as a possibility of cutting off the idea that these resources that are held in the hands of a very few can be opposed and can be overcome by taking the money out of them with alternative energy. Thank you, Jim. That would be so wonderful. Um, and it's such a difficult process because, unfortunately, in our country, there are winners and losers chosen within the political system. And as we've seen through the propaganda of certain media outlets, um, losers seem to be all of the alternative renewable schemes and the winners are oil and gas. But this can't go on forever. You can't ignore the truth forever. And the truth is that we have to leave this in the ground. It's contributing to climate change. The methane emissions are at record levels. Uh, as a matter of fact, methane emissions in general in the world right now are at 1,874 parts per billion, which is um, higher than they've been in the last 400,000 years. So clearly, this is not sustainable. What will happen is we'll either find out through catastrophic injury to our Earth and to the quality of our lives, or we'll find out when some sort of amazing revolution occurs fueled primarily by younger people. Um, and, of course, when Fox News stops broadcasting. That'll help. Uh, we have a question here. Say your name, please. My name is Tom Didek. Thank you for your presentation. I'm an environmental toxicologist, and I've worked uh, as an expert witness both for the defense and the plaintiffs in the uh, uh, Barnett Shale and the Eagle Ford. I've been to Carn City, so I know what you're talking about down there. So mine is more a comment, but... Uh, I'd like you to be, when you're reporting this and talking about all the chemicals that can, can cause problems, it all depends on what level the that they're at. Yes. And from all the data that I've seen, it's not there yet. That's not to say it could never be the way things are developing, but uh, just a caution. Uh, to well, I think what we're seeing, unfortunately, is specific incidents 
wherein the numbers cannot be replicated as you would replicate a test or a sample. And, and that's a problem for some people. The Dupnik family, which is suing over the marathon release, uh, is having problems establishing uh, what those particular numbers were at that time because obviously no one was running around taking tests when that occurred. Uh, they did take tests a couple of days later, however, but, but by that time, the levels had already fallen. They'd fallen to the numbers I showed with the pounds of propane, et cetera. But uh, that's part of the problem. We don't have a regulatory system which is quick enough on the draw to be able to go out and protect our citizens by measuring exactly what these chemical levels are at the times of these releases. And I might add, uh, it's been reported by the Center for Public Integrity and the Weather Channel as well that no one from the TCEQ and no one from the Railroad Commission is making any effort to test the air on a regular basis in the Eagleford Shale. And frankly, it is our position that that is absolutely eminently necessary right now. If you want to do baseline testing and then measure levels at a later time, that would be the best of all possible circumstances. But the sad part is nobody's doing it. Nobody's protecting the health of these people. And we tend to believe that that's the job of the state. That's the job of regulatory agencies. So that's really where we're pushing. But thank you for that comment. We have a question from Marge Wood. Keep it narrow because I just remembered oh, oil and gas aren't usually used for generating electricity, so I'll stay out of that issue. Uh, what I want to know is it seems to me that the news, there's two things I would like, I'm curious about what your opinion is. The newspapers, you can only publish so much, you can only talk about so much. Why did how can we find ways to get our newspapers to talk about renewable energy and conservation and efficiency instead of all the money? I mean, we can, there's a, there is a solar boom going on, and people don't realize it because it doesn't show up. And also the other thing is, what about landowners? Say if a landowner lease their land to a solar farm, for example, then would that keep out the, the other guys? Can, is there any way to keep the frackers out? Thank you. Depends. <clears throat> okay, first question. Um, alternative energy, et cetera, and what is covered in newspapers. You'll notice that when I cited most sources in terms of newspapers or blogs or whatever, I was citing alternative sources. I wasn't saying this appeared in the Austin American Statesman or that appeared in the San Antonio Express News. And for the most part, it seems to be that big city newspapers are driven by business and by corporations. And um, the people who sit on their boards, the people who sit on their publishing and editorial boards are from the business sector as well. So it's really difficult for alternatives and renewables to get a word in edgewise when the entire mindset of most big publishing industry is just that. Um, it's unfortunate that we have to go to alternative sources, but I can tell you right now there's some great alternative sources out there. There's tremendous work being done by Forrest Wilder at the Texas Observer. Uh, Sharon Wilson does some of the finest investigative reporting for a non-journalist I've ever seen. And uh, there are many other fine examples. There's something called the Desmog blog, written by my friend Julie Dermansky. Julie takes great pictures. Julie works with all of us here in Texas. She's an amazing person. So look to the alternatives if you really want the truth, because for right now, big city publishing is bought and paid for. Uh, in terms of solar leases, I, I kind of keep up with those. As a matter of fact, I forwarded you some opportunities for solar leasing. Uh, from my groups on LinkedIn, but um, the fact is that uh, surface rights and below surface rights are two different things, and in most cases in Texas now, people who own the surface rights are not the same people who own the mineral rights below the ground. So if you do not own your mineral rights, you have absolutely no say in what occurs. Even if you do own your mineral rights, you can be forced into a pooling situation and assigned a certain percentage 
of what will be obtained from under the ground. Because, rightfully so, there's no way we can, you know, mark the demarcation of one person's oil and gas versus the next person's oil and gas because it's all underground. So, no question, that's a real legal conundrum. But uh, that's a conversation that's not going to stop in legal or in Texas city circles. So. We have a question here. Would you say your name, please? My name is Mike Powers. Excellent presentation. Thank you. I'm quite envious of your oratorical skills. Um, two questions. Uh, uh, well, would you define a couple of terms for me? Attainment status and slick water. Start with slick water. Um, slick water is the process invented by George Mitchell of Mitchell Energy to uh, go through hydraulic fracturing, which involves a horizontal piping system rather than a vertical well. And the slick water process was necessary to use an anti-fricative motion so that you could eliminate friction in the process of this kind of drilling. Because unlike previous vertical drilling, you're going a very long, long way. So they had to come up with things that could move their systems, their rods and their various uh, systems through the holes they were making with this slick water. Slick water may contain any number of various chemicals, 400, 600. It's really hard to quantify because every company has its own proprietary blend, just like Coca-Cola or Pepsi. And each company swears by their own proprietary blend. So that is what is called slick water. The slick water process has made hydraulic fracturing possible. And without it, there would be no hydraulic fracturing. So we can all thank the late George Mitchell for that. But we have a question. some good things. We have a question from Ken Coyne. We have about five minutes. Uh, Alexis, it costs seven fifty for a DVD made today. But can we get your talk on YouTube, and do you have 40 of them already there? No, I don't, but I probably should. So, um, yes, I'll work on that in the future. Thank you, Kenneth, for that suggestion. So I'll work on that, I promise. And, of course, we have DVDs uh, that we offer here through the bookstore of this talk. Hi, my name is Shelley, and I am actually from Bastrop County. Just found out about this event yesterday and made sure I was here. Um, I am a part of a small group of people who are relatively active in fighting things that we don't like. One of them is the other counties around us trying to steal our water from us. So we're already dealing with that. Um, and we were talking about trying to get um, fracking banned in the county. Okay, I know. <laughs> um, but the city of Dallas managed to do that. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. And also if you could expound a little bit on exactly where in Bastrop County right now so that we can get started. Um, I realize that we all understand that our government is funded by stuff and we have to change all of that. We don't have time for that right now. So do you have alternative things and ideas? Thank you. Okay, let's see. Um, what part of Bastrop County? It is definitely the lower part of Bastrop County. And if you Google Serban field, you'll find a whole bunch of different things on the internet. Eventually, you'll come up with something that'll show you approximately where that is. But it's definitely the lower part of Bastrop, more of Lee County, definitely, than Bastrop County. Uh, there's one completed well, but they're already drilling many more. Uh, their plans right now, are, they're looking between 26 and 30 was the last number I heard. Um, Part of the problem in Texas is that counties do not have ordinance making capability. So it's not possible for a county to come up with an ordinance that bans fracking because they don't have the legal opportunity to do that. A city could presumably ban fracking if they get it on the books in advance. Um, part of the problem with that is that there are legal definitions of when drilling begins that do not quantify with what you and I think is the beginning of drilling. And that includes going out and surveying and doing a little stripping. That's when drilling begins. So um, you have to get in before that happens. Um, there are opportunities to fight that. Um, I can give you contact information for some people who can help you with a model ordinance on that issue. 
And uh, the sad news is I can tell you that there's people in Bryan College Station trying to do that right now, and so far it's not working. They're running into legal problems within the infrastructure of the legal system in Brazos County itself. So I don't know enough about the law in Bastrop County. I can't say that, but we'll see. Um, what we can do now, the best thing we can do is organize. Uh, we can organize. We can have meetings. There have been two great town halls recently in the Eagleford Shale. The first one in Panama Rio, which is seen on the Weather Channel's presentation, uh, Big Oil, Bad Air. Um, and a recent one in Yorktown to try to do something about the injection wells that are taking over the city. So that's the only thing you really can do at this stage. Get together with your neighbors. Explain to them that this is a health issue and it's about everyone's future. And I think that'll get them going. So just organize. Absolutely. Michael Walsh. So uh, I really love the fact that your presentation went into detail as far as the effect of the big rigs and the diesel exhaust and the damage to the roads. And so my question to you is, uh, if you had seen anybody who wants to try to get a, a handle on grasping the entire economic impact and the economic cost of this kind of drilling, not just on the communities in the air, but also the long-term uh, viability as it will play out as a bust, as you have said. Um, that's a, a very good question. Um, there's an unfortunate turn of events in academia over the last few years that my colleague Sharon Wilson has come to call fracademia uh, because there, there has arisen within various universities and colleges which have great endowments from oil and gas companies, let's face it, um, a willingness to apparently have their product purchased by those oil and gas companies in many ways. There have been people who've been released from their university positions when that was discovered. So it's hard to think about someone like the Bureau of Economic Geology at the University of Texas attempting such a thing, or any other university in Texas attempting such a thing entirely because of their endowments. So I think our best chance is England. Um, I think we could probably find some major university in another country where they would be willing to take a look at this, but I don't think it's going to happen in Texas, and I don't think it's going to happen in the U.S. right now. Just too much money. Alyssa, thank you for a very important, if alarming, talk. It's, it's definitely a call to action for all of us.